stumbling in there don't charge you nothing for the mistakes so how's everybody doing I'm doing pretty good uh, feel good I spent a lot of time with the uh, wife and kid listening to records and uh, playing outside and doing all the stuff the weather's really nice here in Nashville here's to you Topo Chico up for you so we're gonna talk about blues tonight my favorite um, and I just want to preface, um, because, uh, you know, these are just things that, uh, there are guys, there's so many guys that are way better than me and way more knowledgeable and all that. Uh, this is just my feeble attempt at, at, uh, trying to entertain some folks out there and, and, uh, maybe turn some people on to, uh, some stuff that I dig that maybe they, they, maybe they've heard about, maybe they've not heard about it. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that's just my disclaimer up front. Uh, this is all stuff tonight that I really love and I just really, when it comes down to, I mean, I love all types of music. I know a lot of people say that I, I really do. I mean, I like, uh, I really like classical music. I like, um, I like tons of jazz, lots of different types of jazz, even though I'm not a jazz player. I like pop music. Um, I like rap. Um, I like uh, electronic music, EDM. Um, there's uh, obviously soul music, funk, and all that. But I just, I just really dig music. And um, but when it comes down to it, um, the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight is probably the stuff that's nearest and dearest to my heart. And like most people um, that are in my age group, you know, uh, who are in their early to mid thirties, um, uh, you know, I was turned on to the majority of this stuff through, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan and through Eric Clapton and Jimi Hendrix and all that stuff. And, um, Jimi Hendrix was a, when I was a little kid was a really big thing, really big deal for me as with millions of others. And, um, Steve Ray Vaughan when I was, because, you know, I, that, that's right in the kind of the sweet spot of the wake of his, um, touching the world. And, uh, also Eric Clapton. I mean, I was massively, massively obsessed with, uh, with Eric Clapton, with Cream and Blind Faith and John Mayall and Derek and the Dominoes and all that stuff. Um, but then a couple of different things happened. Hendrix has stayed with me all those years, but then I talked about it in the last episode where um, when I was about 18 years old, I heard uh, the first Fabulous Thunderbirds record, and I've, I've never listened to Stevie since. Um, I just completely fell in love with with his older brother, and um, and it just touched me in such a deep and profound way that I just never, um, I just kind of let all the Stevieisms and all that kind of go completely where I don't really think any of it is left really in my playing. Um, not that I don't love him and respect him, but, um, just Jimmy had a much more profound impact, lasting impact. And uh, also with Clapton, like, you know, it was, uh, up until, you know, a good many years ago, eight or nine years ago, you know, I was heavily, heavily obsessed and I just started whittling away and becoming more obsessed with some of these people that were going to that I'm going to talk about tonight. So, um, uh, without me wasting any more of your time. So, um, that, uh, thing that I was butchering through on the, uh, the intro there is sort of in the style of, uh, Pee Wee Creighton. 
Uh, I'm going to back up a little bit first. The first guy I want to talk about, um, first guy I want to talk about is this guy right here. This is uh, the great T-Bone Walker. Um, T-Bone was in the 40s, probably the first, you know, he wasn't, I don't think he was technically the first electric blues guitar player, but he was definitely the, the first biggest influential one. Um, that had the widest range of influence and 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 touching people all over the world, and uh, as you can see, he was quite the showman. Um, and uh, T Bone was uh, T Bone was a, a really important figure because people like BB King and a lot of these other people that I'm going to talk about that are really influential. Um, T-Bone Walker's kind of where it all starts, you know, and so, uh, and in the meantime, you know what, I'm going to, since we're getting all fancy on this, I'm going to go ahead and throw, throw that up there, and I'm also going to throw that up there, if you want to throw some stuff in the JD, throw some tips in the JD Simo, home for JD Simo, I thank you. Um, so, uh, T-Bone played a guitar just like this, it's an old ES5, and, um, T-Bone... <laughs> You know, he's definitely one of the first guys that ever, like, bent that note, like, would later become Chuck Berry. So he... Um, I'm sort of playing in his style. Um, sing that a lot that 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 phrasing in that line but also that's one of the turnarounds he would use a lot going to the five <laughs> is he, 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 because he's, he's staying in this box and all this stuff we're going to talk about is very, um, uh, pentatonic based. It's all about, all these guys had very specific phrasing and tone. Um, that's the thing that kind of differentiates them. So, um, but this flat five, which is just such a great blue note. The, the, using the flat five. Let me see if I can get a get it more honky. Yeah, baby. Don't 
Don't throw your love on me so strong. Your love is like a faucet. You can turn it off and on. that kind of style so very elegant very uptown um but incredibly influential you can hear where guys like chuck berry bb king um everybody that kind of came after t-bone walker um you know he's the first great important um you know like other in that time period other than like Django reinhardt um and charlie christian you know you you have those are really important um, pivotal guitarists in kind of the evolution of the instrument. Um, one thing I want to say, I want to try and get all this stuff in, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move kind of quick at times. So anyway, this I do want to throw this up here. This is a record that um, is easy to find. It's actually on Spotify, and um, this is my favorite you know, recording period, you know, this is the Imperial recordings and, um, all these guys that I'm going to talk about have like different eras where they recorded f for different companies. And, um, this is a great record to listen to. Um, and, uh, it's, it's really easy to find. So, uh, so anyway, so check that, check that out. Okay. So, uh, moving along, I want to talk about, uh, a guy named Pee Wee Creighton. Uh, this guy right here this is a, a picture from later in life uh, uh, vintage guitar nuts always uh, went nuts over his iconic custom color uh, 50 Strat there and um, Pee Wee is another guy from Texas who went out to Los Angeles Pee Wee's a little younger than T-Bone um, but he was very influenced by T-Bone Walker and um, Pee Wee, there's, there's some other guys too um, from that era. There's a guy named Gory Carter. Gory Carter is another really great um, guy sort of in the T-Bone style. And also Gatemouth Brown, a very young Gatemouth Brown, uh, was making records in the 40s and stuff, like even before B.B. King was really doing stuff full on. Uh, but Pee Wee's one that I love a lot. He's more aggressive than T Bone. T Bone's real elegant, laid back. He, even when T Bone would play um, an up tempo song, you know, like. kind of regal and, and uptown and, and classy. Whereas Pee Wee actually had like more of an aggressive kind of sound and he would throw some of those jazzier types of phrasings in. Um, so like for example he would do something, this is something sort of in his style, you know. <laughs>
that kind of thing. It's just more aggressive and, and um, a little notier and a little more rock and roll. And, um, um, and Pee Wee is, you know, somebody that, I mean, a lot of my friends, um, and I feel weird, you know, because there's so many great guys like Junior Watson, um, Kid Ramos and stuff that can do this stuff a lot better than me. I just kind of have a, a, a grasp of it to a certain extent, but I, you know, when it comes down to it, I'm a pretty meat and potatoes kind of guitar player. Um, but, um, but I love this stuff. And, um, so Pee Wee, um, there's a record, um, that again is just on Spotify. This one right here, um, the Texas blues jumping to Los Angeles. Uh, this is a great record. And again, it's, it's from the era that I, that I like the most, which is when he was recording for modern, um, which is, uh, which is earlier on in his life, but there's a lot of really good stuff. I mean, I really, um, I'm a fan regardless. You know. Um, <clears throat> so those are two things. Uh, those are two guys that are, are kind of close, closely related. And, um, two guys that I like a lot and both of them played ES5s like this. Um, so now I want to talk about, um, somebody who kind of, uh, two guys actually, but, um, there's, uh, uh, I actually only did nine records last week. I, uh, I forgot about the last one, uh, cause I was trying, we were running so long and I just want to try and keep these around an hour cause I mean, that's long enough, right? So, um, Anyway, the last record that I had on my list was um, was actually uh, this record, which is a Jimmy Reed record. This is called Upside Your Head, which is a, a record I had when I was younger. And it's one of many, many, many that have, you know, his biggest hits. Baby, What Do You Want Me To Do? Shame, Shame, Shame. Going To New York. Uh, you, you Got Me Dizzy and um, High and Lonesome and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and so anyway, here's a here's a picture of uh, Jimmy Reed, um, and another really important guy playing behind him um, that I'll get to in a minute. But uh, Jimmy Reed, um, again, kind of like T-Bone Walker, um, is just an incredibly important um, part of American music because um, Jimmy made records. Um, that crossed over and were on the pop charts, okay? Like, um, Baby, What Do You Want Me To Do was actually like a pop hit, you know? Which is something that, you know, other than somebody like Chuck Berry, you know, who recorded for Chess in the 50s, and it's just a really, it was a rare thing, you know, uh, Freddie King with Hideaway uh, for King Federal, you know, it was just a rare thing for R&B records, for blues records, you know, to cross over onto the pop charts, you know? And um, Jimmy Reed is some of the first stuff I ever learned to play because it's very approachable. It just feels so good still. All these years later. say a lot is you know that's sort of the invention of that which would be copied by millions of people and that's like inventing the alphabet okay and you know I don't know it's just it's it's very simple but it's just such a bedrock of uh, of American music you know you got me running me hiding, you got me running by the house, we'll be everywhere you want me to roll, yeah, 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 you got me doing what you want.
couple of things about Jimmy Reed is, you know, when you go to the five, you don't play the, the root, you know, you which, you know, I'm sure a lot of you know that. Um, but one guy that I want to talk about, so, you know, Jimmy Reed, just really important, you know, those songs are important to have at least heard and listened to, you know, um, bedrock of American music. But I want to talk about the guy that's over Jimmy Reed's shoulder here, okay? And actually, you know what? I'll tell you a good Jimmy Reed story, okay? This is a story I heard from James Pennebaker, uh, my dear friend J James Pennebaker, who uh, who plays with uh, Delbert McClinton. And this is actually an old uh, Delbert McClinton story. So Delbert was a young man and, um, uh, uh, you know, grew up in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth and... Um, Jimmy Reed used to play around there all the time. And so um, Delbert's band got the opportunity to back up Jimmy Reed. And um, uh, Delbert had been saving his money to buy a new microphone. Okay. Um, this is, I guess, in the early 60s. And. Uh, <laughs> um, he was all excited because he was going to, he got his, he was, he was going to be able to pay it off and get the new microphone in time for the show, uh, opening for and playing with Jimmy Reed. And, um, uh, so the day comes and, and so, uh, Delbert's got his microphone. He's all proud of it. And they get up and they do their set and then they back up Jimmy Reed and Jimmy Reed sits down and, uh, has Delbert's microphone and just throws up just terrible white gin vomit just throws up all over Delbert's new mic. <laughs> and uh, uh, apparently Delbert still has the microphone <laughs> and like has it in his case uh, like with his Grammys and stuff. That's his Jimmy Reed vomit microphone. Oh man. So uh, anyway, you know, these guys were a bit different uh, than you and me. Well, I don't know. I guess they weren't too different, but they were. Anyway, so uh, now I want to talk about Eddie Taylor, who uh, is the guy standing over Jimmy's shoulder right there. Eddie Taylor uh, basically taught Jimmy Reed how to play guitar. They grew up together in Mississippi. And um, here's another, here's a later picture of Eddie Taylor. Um, I posted this a couple nights ago. And uh, Eddie not only played guitar on all the Jimmy Reed records, but pretty much invented that style that and even more importantly he um, he taught a very young Freddie King how to play and Magic Sam who are both guys I'm going to talk about in a minute and um, Eddie Taylor um, he had a uh, an interesting style. So he had like, you know, he he really liked to favor like if you're playing an E the
thing. So it's kind of it's it's sort of similar to Lightning Hopkins, but it's not as flashy. He would, you know, that. that you can see are kind of relatable to like what Freddie King would do. And uh, another thing, and I'm gonna switch to, to red for a minute, is um, the concept of like vibrato, which um, is the Achilles heel of most uh, guitar players. Um, that and phrasing. Um, Eddie Taylor, um, is even before B.B. King, Eddie Taylor, like, you know, the whole... Taylor would the dan da dan da dan da dan da dan sort of phrasing over a, a, a slow shuffle. That's a very Eddie Taylor kind of thing. But if you there's some videos of Eddie Taylor later on. There's a really good one of him playing with the Aces in France in like 1970 or something. He would vibrato with his middle finger, kind of like uh, Clapton would do. Which has a different sound. I tend to vibrato with my third finger. That's kind of the Eddie Taylor kind of style. And um, uh, I thought I had a record here. I guess I don't. I guess I screwed up. There's, um, there's a couple of records of Eddie Taylor's on Spotify. I Feel So Bad is one of my favorites. And then another one is called... Um, uh, there's another one called Bad Boy, which is a song of his that was kind of famous um so i'd listen to either one of those um but eddie taylor really important guy i learned about eddie taylor um through uh uh loving jimmy vaughn uh jimmy uh, uh knew eddie taylor and uh jimmy rogers who is also really important jimmy was the original lead guitar player in muddy waters band in the late 40s early 50s and so Jimmy Rogers and um, Eddie Taylor were kind of the um, the old guard, if you will, of guitar players in Chicago. So when everybody came up, when a young buddy guy came to town, or Magic Sam, or Freddie King, or Hubert Sumlin, or um, you know, when they, you know, they 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 all to to a certain extent all kind of came under the tutelage of of Jimmy Rogers or Eddie Taylor, or certainly of Earl Hooker, um, who are, I'm also gonna talk about in a minute. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of talk a little encapsulation about Jimmy Reed and about Eddie Taylor. And um, uh, this next guy, you know, is no secret to anybody. This is, that's an old photo of Earl Hooker. And um, it's pretty well documented how much I love Earl Hooker. Earl Hooker is one of my absolute favorites. And um, I've talked about him probably a little too much, but you know, when I was uh, younger, uh, learning to play uh, slide, um, you know, it was I was, you know, like anybody, I was really into Dwayne Allman and um, a lot of uh, Ry Cooter and um, those guys in particular. Um, and of course, you know, being the age I am, hearing people like Derek Trucks and 
um, and even in pop music, you know, hearing people like Mike Campbell and, um, but Earl Hooker has just continued to be probably my favorite. I probably listen to Earl Hooker the most. And I'm actually going to throw this up here. This is another, I told you guys about Two Bugs and a Roach. This is another record that's on um, Spotify. This is called The Leading Brand, and this is him and Jody Williams. And this is a great record. This is actually one I probably listen to more often than others. And um, it's just a funky, funky record. Great songs. And um, it's him backing up Jody Williams some of the time. I mean, but I've I've got pretty much everything that he ever recorded and that I can find at least, and um, you know, I just love his funky style, you know. <laughs> that I want to talk about. I'm going to take a drink of my Topo Chico. Here's to you folks. I hope you're having a good time. I'm having a good time. One of the cool things about Earl Hooker is um, I actually have something in common with him, which is he loved country music, and he actually grew up playing fiddle tunes and um, playing lots of country music. And I, of course, for years, um, played in the Don Kelly Band here in Nashville, playing bluegrass and um, it was one of the things that set him apart from all the other guys in Chicago. Um, because if you listen, like Earl, Earl could play like BB King, and you know, he if you listen to you know. <laughs> single note style which is actually more similar to Magic Sam who who learned from him um, but then he would play slide in standard tuning and and would play um, all over the neck um, in a way that was kind of more forward than Elmore James but then he would he would play uh, uh, in the clubs at least he would play Ernest Tubb songs or Bob Wills like uh, 
like uh, Roly Pole. I used to play this with Don Kelly. Uh... That's something that uh, there's a there's a clip of, of Earl Hooker on that uh, tour that he did in Europe with Magic Sam um, singing I'm walking the floor over you he loved all that stuff and that's something also you got to keep in mind you know like a lot of these guys um, who grew up in the south you know they listen to the Grand Old Opry you know they might not sound like it but these you know that's what they were exposed to you know they listen to Roy Acuff and they listen to uh, Hank Williams. Um, you know, music was, um, uh, how shall I say, like, the radio was king then. So it's like whatever you had exposure to is what you listen to, you know. So um, a lot of these guys, um, I remember um, uh, talking to the great Reggie Young uh, one time, the great session player from uh, uh, from Memphis, uh, the guy who played Son of a Preacher Man, you know. And uh, he also played... Uh, But uh, anyway, he, he grew up in Memphis uh, in the 50s, and he talked about um, uh, the Grand Old Opry and, like, listening to Chet Atkins and loving all that stuff. You know, he was a stone, stone R&B guitar player. That could be another episode. But uh, at any rate, Earl Hooker, love him a lot, one of my biggest heroes, one of my favorites. And uh, check out the leading brand, that record. I'll put it up, uh, I'll put it up one more time. Uh, another record for you guys to check out right there. All right, so the next guy I want to talk about is this guy right here, Magic Sam. Magic, Magic Sam Maggot. <clears throat> Magic Sam's story is a very tragic story. Um, so uh, he's from Mississippi, and um, as I understand it, he moved up to Chicago, and he couldn't get it. You know, he learned to play from from Eddie Taylor and Jimmy Rogers, or at least refined his playing with those guys, and Earl Hooker to a certain extent. And he was kind of, you know, he was younger. He He's, I think, about the same age as Buddy Guy, maybe a little bit younger, maybe. I'm not quite sure. I think he, or I don't know, somewhere around there. But, you know, he, he was definitely uh, the kid, you know, um, along with guys like, like Buddy Guy and Hubert Sumlin and stuff like that, younger guys um, in Chicago. And um, this is a great photo of him actually recording his last record, which is a record called Black Magic, um, uh, which is actually my favorite, actually. that's This is that record right there, Black Magic, um, which you can find on Spotify. That's my favorite. Um, he recorded that right before he died. 
Um, uh, but anyway, uh, just some background on Magic Sam. Uh, Magic Sam, uh, like many, couldn't get arrested in Chicago uh, by Chess Records. Tried to get a record deal, tried to get a record deal, couldn't get a record deal. And um, uh, ended up going to the west side of Chicago to a little label called Cobra, which is uh, um, an amazing label that made great stuff. That's where Otis Rush went, that's where Buddy Guy went, um, that's actually where Freddie King went. Um, and uh, so Magic Sam <coughs> cut um, a decent amount of sides for Cobra in the late 50s, 58, somewhere, somewhere like that. Um, there's some really good stuff in there. Um, there's a, uh, his tune, uh, All Your Love. But anyway, Cobra folded, went out of business, and um, Sam sort of languished around Chicago, not able to kind of get anything going. And um, he, when the Vietnam War um, ignited, um, he was drafted and he didn't report. Um, and the story goes that um, Sam... And I, this, this could be wrong, but this is what I was told. And it, I would believe it. It's, it seems believable to me. Um, that uh, a rival of his at another club in Chicago turned him in to save himself, essentially. And uh, Sam ended up going to prison for draft dodging, not going to Vietnam. And um, which, you know, I mean, for a poor young black guy at the time, I mean, that probably would have been a death sentence, I would imagine. Um, so, he went to prison. In the meantime, a lot of his peers, Otis Rush, Freddie King, Buddy Guy, all become stars, okay? He's in prison, and everybody starts getting record deals and starts doing well for themselves. This is in the early, you know, early to mid-60s. And so he gets out of prison, and he's sort of discouraged, and at the urging of a guy named Bob Kester, who ran a very famous record store, influential record store in Chicago, um, called uh, the Jazz Record Mart. Um, he also founded Delmark Records, which is a very important blues label um, from, this, from this era, from the 60s. And he encouraged uh, Sam and signed him. And they made a very influential record, this record right here, West Side Soul, which went on to actually sell very decently and kind of got Sam's um, career going. This is in like 67-ish, okay? And so this record comes out, it does pretty good. He starts touring around, um, playing uh, college stuff. He played um, the Ann Arbor Blues Fest, which was a big, important blues festival in those days um, that people would come to, kind of like the Newport Jazz Festival was, in that it was one of those big festivals people would come from all over the country, and if you were showcased at that, it would kind of, you know, it could blow you up, essentially, um, in those days. And um, so Sam did his first tour of Europe with Earl Hooker, um, oddly enough, and the only footage, video footage that exists of Sam uh, or of Earl Hooker is from that tour. And uh, you can see Matt, uh, Sam's actually playing Earl Hooker's guitar, the one, the, the fake Les Paul with the, uh, with, the, with the flowers on it and the mailbox letters. And um, because the airlines actually lost Sam's guitar. Um, on that tour and um, so anyway Sam came back from that tour made Black Magic um, his second record this record my favorite and then promptly at the age of 32 died a month later of a heart attack which is tragic 
right as everything was starting to get going. Um, Sam Style, um, he had a couple of things that were, I sort of already did, like he had this kind of flourishy. <laughs> very clean very clean not a lot of overdrive with with magic sand very clean it has to be kind of clean and chimey you know it's sort of in between bb king and freddie king like it's slightly more aggressive and a little bit more staccato um than bb but it's not as intense and uh piercing as freddie um, he also sort of, uh, like if we're, uh, in G, this is a song of his I do a lot. Well, I don't want much, I just want a little bit, well, I don't want it all, I just want a little bit. said like it's it's sort of in between bb and freddie king it's a little more restrained than freddie king it's a little more um pulled back his phrasing's not as fluid it's a little you know to pick up kind of thing um he used tremolo quite a bit on slow blueses you know um he had many songs like easy baby <laughs> big one he does that a lot He's a big influence on me, someone that I love a lot, and um, and uh, definitely worth checking out. There's a bunch of outtakes um, also that's pretty easy to find on Spotify uh, from the from the Black Magic sessions. They're called all, all sorts of different things, um, and then there's 
all of the stuff that he recorded in the 50s for Cobra, which is pretty easy to find, too. Um, I, I really like Black Magic. I like the tunes. He seemed really confident. I mean, I listened to West Side Soul a million times, and uh, I've sort of worn it out. It's one of those things where it's like I love it, but I, it's sort of like uh, the Allman Brothers at Fillmore East or, or Cream's... Uh, wheels of fire or something like i've listened to it so many times that it's kind of like i'm good um i'll listen to uh to black magic though so uh anyway so magic sam love you buddy <clears throat> so uh this next cat is a hound dog taylor somebody that is uh another guy that i just adore and um very similar kind of story to Magic Sam in that uh, he uh, couldn't get arrested, couldn't get a record deal, couldn't get anything going. And um, a guy by the name of Bruce Iglauer actually formed a record company to make Hound Dog's first album, which is the le now legendary Alligator Records um, that I know you all have seen and are aware of. That record label was founded um, because Bruce loved Hound Dog Taylor so much. And he tried to get um, uh, Bob Kester, who I was talking about, the founder of Delmark, um, to, uh, to record him. And uh, Bob didn't really, you know, didn't really get it, didn't really dig it as much. And so... Um, so that was, that was the end of it. So, so Bruce got his money together and, uh, went and rented a studio and, um, you know, the rest is history. And, uh, the, uh, the record that they made together is, is my favorite. It's the, it's the first Hound Dog Taylor and the, and the House Rockers record. And um, incidentally, that guitar that he's playing right there, Dan Arbach from the Black Keys actually owns that guitar now. And I saw it when it was getting refurbished. He actually bought it from Bruce Siglauer. One of the coolest things I've ever seen. Um, Dan's got one of the coolest collections. I've seen a lot of collections. Been really fortunate, but Dan's got some of the cool. He's got Mississippi Fred McDowell's old Trini Lopez. He's got guitars that are like they're not necessarily like the most intrinsically expensive, but they are just so they're cool and important. And so, anyway, Hound Dog Taylor, that record definitely got to listen to him. And uh, and uh, Hound Dog had a very uh, wild style. Um, not, at, not nearly as refined as Earl Hooker. Um, he was wild, and um, I just love it. And uh, there's a tune of his, um, a tune of his called "She's Gone," on um, which opens the the House Rockers record. <laughs>
Tyler. So he, I'm tuned down lower than he was, but he had a real fat sound and he had a real, the key is no, vo, no reverb, dry, okay? And vo, wide vibrato. <laughs> would be more, you know. Whereas like Hound Dog is. That kind of thing, that sort of fast vibrato. This is tuned down to uh, B, I believe. So I'm capoed up. So I'm actually playing in uh, a whole step down from, you know. So that's a D, you know. But it's still in standard tuning, you know. Taylor, Brucey Glauer formed Alligator Records to release a record on him, and the rest is history. And actually, his career was made um, also by a, a famous performance at the uh, uh, Ann Arbor Blues Festival, uh, same as Magic Sam, and um, just hellacious stuff. Really, really good, and uh, something that. Uh, doesn't get talked about as much as it probably should. Okay, talk about guys who should get talked about more. This guy right here. This is Earl King. Okay? Earl King um, is from Louisiana. And um, he had sort of two different careers. Um, like a lot of these guys. He had an early period in the 50s, early 60s. And then sort of had a resurgence in the 70s and made great records then as well. And um, the most famous way that you would know um, Earl King is actually the song Come On, which is on Electric Lady, which is uh, on Electric Ladyland, you know, the People talking, but they just don't know What's in my heart and why I love you so I love you, baby, like a mine of loose gold So come on, baby, let the good times roll famous thing um but he um especially on uh this is actually the hardest to find record that i'm going to tell you about tonight but find it this right here is all the imperial recordings and this is all of the early stuff the original version of come on and just great single note playing um sort of like an expanding on the guitar slim sort of model like using your fingers not using a pick and
of in that major tonality. Um, there's an old song I do of Earl King's that also Gatemouth, uh, or that Johnny Johnny Guitar Watson used to do, which is called Those Lonely, Lonely Nights. There's been some lonely, lonely nights Well, since you've been gone Lay my head on my pillow how I cried all night long The things you used to say to me I thought that we would never part Darling, you know that I love you So darling, why did you break my heart? single note um, similar in certain ways to Gatemouth Brown gotta use your fingers on that gotta use the index finger you know uh I'd cheat and use my thumb a little bit because I have a little more control with my thumb but um Another thing I want to say, and I know that, gosh, you know, the episode's getting long again, but uh, I appreciate you all. Thank you for hanging in there with me, uh, those of you that are. Um, this record is also really good, Earl King. This is Street Parade. This is later on. And actually, later on, he would do stuff with the meters, and he sort of had a funk career, which is as good. I mean, it's important to kind of listen to both eras. So, you know, like this record is a great record for the later era. This record, um, either order it. I think you probably find it on Amazon or I'm sure it's probably on YouTube. Um, so go and find that. So uh, moving along, um, you know, since we're already talking about Earl King, you know, we'll talk about Freddie King, uh, one of my absolute favorites. Um, Freddie, um, I actually want to tell a bit of a story about um freddie moved from texas to chicago in the late 40s um and he uh again like magic sam like um uh earl hooker um he he, he couldn't get arrested okay uh, couldn't get a deal with chess um there's folklore about the great Willie Dixon, the great bass player and writer for chess, taking the young Freddie King over to Cobra, who, which I mentioned earlier over on the west side, and trying to get him going over there, but nothing really happened there either. So there's a really great story where, you know, okay, so the whole 50s go by, 
Okay, he moves to 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 Chicago, and I think it was forty eight, and um, ended up getting a, a factory job, like many, uh, like my grandfather and my father, um, in those days in Chicago, and um, you know because the stockyards, for example, in Chicago, like that's. I mean, I think like fifty or sixty thousand people worked at the stockyard, slaughtering hogs and and shipping meat all over the country. Um, that's where my grandfather worked, and that's where my dad worked um, in those days, um, in the thirties and forties. Um, my father was, a, a, you know, was a bit older, um, and so actually his first job was working at the stockyards um, uh, with my grandfather and um, Freddie. Freddie and his family, like many, came looking for work, you know, because there wasn't a lot of work in those days, and um, especially after World War II. Um, so, uh, so Freddie got a factory job and would play around town. And so, you know, the whole decade goes by, and he's clearly great, but um, Chess and everybody else said, oh, he sounds too much like B.B. King, um, which he may have. I've never heard anything from that era, so I can't really have an opinion on it, but... Uh, he, uh, so he was, there's a lot of different versions of the story, but essentially what had happened was nothing was happening in Chicago for Freddie. So he goes to Cincinnati where King Federal Records is, okay? And King Federal, uh, most notably, is like uh, James Brown. That's where Please, Please, Please and Cold Sweat, this is in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, uh, were cut and released and a lot of other cool stuff. Um, they're actually, the old studio is, they're trying to make it into a museum and hopefully they, they accomplish that. Um, I actually hopped the fence um, a year or two ago <laughs> to go find the old studio. It's all boarded up now. It's like a, 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 a dilapidated, funky old building now that like the roof's caved in and stuff, but uh, I wanted to see it, so you know. So the guys waited for me and I hopped the fence and went and looked at it. And um, so anyway, uh, Freddie goes there to play on a session. And um, actually, this record right here, it's, it's kind of hard to find. Um, I think this is it. Yeah, this one right here. Smokey Smothers, if you can find this album. This is Freddie King backing up a guy named Smokey Smothers. This is a really important record. Because Freddie was just hired as a sideman. And you can hear, I mean, he's sort of playing like Eddie Taylor because that's what they wanted him to do. I'm, I'm guessing that's what they told him to play like, you know, that I was talking about earlier, that kind of, uh, you know. That kind of thing. But you can hear at different times that something's going on here. So the next day, Freddie comes back uh, because he impressed the head of the head of the company. He said, "Come back the next day." And so, the very next day after he cut that record as a sideman, he cut. Just like I was talking earlier about Jimmy Reed and Chuck Berry and all that, went on to become a, a huge hit record, and all of a sudden Freddie King has this big career. And it all spawned from him playing on that Smokey Smothers record. So it's a, go find that record, because that's a great record to listen to, because the very next day is when he cuts Hideaway. So Freddie, I mean, I can watch the old Beat Club footage of him in Dallas, um, I could watch that every day. It's just the greatest thing ever. And um, he was such a funky player, aggressive, and um, I, I love everything about it. Uh, I love uh, uh, San Jose, but I love the one on the beat show where it's funky. It's not the the upbeat. It's. <laughs> Thank you. 
could play that stuff all day, all night. Um, again, using your finger. I was playing a pick with some of it, um, but uh, playing with your fingers really to get that Freddy. Uh, <laughs> had little things they would do. And another thing with Freddie is, you know, a lot of his stuff, There's sometimes there's a little reverb, but again, dry, uh, fairly dry, uh, his sound, um, stinging, you know, and I've got, on red here, I've got this uh, switch that Joe Blazer put in here a long time ago that makes it go out of phase, and that's really important for Freddie's tone, you know. do that all day long and do sometimes and um, this record is really great this is on Apple Music um, it's just a really good collection of some of the not as frequent tunes from from the King Federal era you know there's tunes on this like uh, she must have put the whammy on me and Texas oil and just not the same 14 tunes that you've that 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 like are really easy to find um and and it's also a mixture of instrumentals and vocals and what a singer he was too man just just insane um so quickly i mean i can't not talk about earl king and freddie king without talking about uh you know this guy albert king i love this photo albert king was <laughs> just says it all man he just looks like a hard dude, man. Just a guy that you really wouldn't want to mess with or wouldn't want to lose to in a poker game or something. And um, a record of his that I love a lot is this record right here. This is also on Apple Music. Um, this is actually his first record. This is from 61, 62. This is about, this is years before he signed with Stax and did Born Under a Bad Sign on all this. And I actually just like the tunes on this better. And his playing is a little raw. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I just, I love Albert. I, I probably, li I like BB the most and Freddie Albert's probably the least that's in my playing. And I think probably because, um, I just, I don't know. We all have things that we like and all that, but I love Albert King, obviously. And, um, with, with Albert, um, again, you got to use your fingers and uh, he's a lot of times would use the neck pickup. Uh, Sometimes he would bend it all on one string, you know, like. Thank you. 
that kind of thing. And again, like um, a lot of the records are dry. They're they're they're. Um, this is coming from a complete reverb junkie that I am, but uh, a lot of his recorded sounds are drier than they may they may appear, and Albert just listening intently probably was on the neck pickup more than I thought he was. I've been listening to more lately and But those are those in between lays. attempt at trying to play like Albert King. And so uh, last but not least cannot be anything but B.B. King. Um, I don't know. For my money, I think he's, you know, other than Chuck Berry, probably the most important influential musician in the history of music. And uh, there, there just wouldn't be so much music, guitar playing, if it wasn't for B.B. King. Um, his influence across the multitudes of the planet is just remarkable. I mean, it truly is kind of the, the, the great American dream, you know, abject poverty to be an international icon. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, I love BB King always have. Um, I love both, the earliest eras when he's on Kent and Crown and he doesn't have the vibrato yet and he's playing more like T-Bone or Pee Wee Creighton or obviously the later, you know, uh, the electric eel, as he used to call his style when his vibrato came around, uh, live at the Regal. Um, I talked about Blues is King last week. Um, there's a record that I want to hip you guys to if you're not hip to it. This record right here, this is called My Kind of Blues. And this is actually Anson Thunderbird's favorite record. Um, Anson, it, 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 um, Anson, who also is one of my, I mean, he's one of my dearest, dearest friends. Um, he's like a member of my family now. And he's a huge hero of mine and a very dear friend. He's shared so much with me, um, and I love him dearly. Um, this record is the, the essence of his playing, and uh, you can hear it uh, easily. This is a great album. This is him, uh, BB, in the early 60s. This is before Live at the Regal. <clears throat> and this is actually, without the horns, he's backed by the great Lloyd Glenn Trio. So it's very stripped down, uh, just piano, bass, drums, and BB. And I swear to God, I think BB's playing a Stratocaster on this record. Listen to it and let me know what you think. Uh, but this is a great record. Um, just incredible performances. And, um, you know, you can't... I, I, I can't speak of his his influence and how much I love him enough. And, uh, you know, uh, when you put on Live at the Regal, which, you know, is influential and, and there's a reason why it's like everybody's favorite record, you know, B.B. Uh, King! <laughs>
So, uh, guys, I can't believe that I've been yakking and playing for an hour and a half. But, um, man, I've sure enjoyed it. And uh, I certainly hope that, uh, if nothing else, you've been entertained. Um, there's so many great, you know, modern guys that epitomize all this that I've been talking about way better than I um, the great Jimmy Vaughn, Anson Funderbird, um, Junior Watson, Kid Ramos, uh, Ronnie Earl, um, and there's also some young guys that I love, like uh, my good, uh, I, well, I can't really call him my good friend, we've only met one time, but Dylan Bishop down in Austin, Texas, he's, he's the real thing, and I have a lot of respect for him. Kid Anderson uh, out in California ridiculously great and uh, real soulful and the real thing and um, a local guy here Patrick Sweeney here in Nashville who's a funky funky guy and I love the way I love the way he sings I love the way he plays he's the real thing there's a lot of it you know so at any rate um, please please continue to take care of yourself and um, and I'll uh I'll see you next week here on Greasy Time. Much love, and uh, may the force be with you, always. <laughs>